Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss Circular 230. And it reads, the title of it, Regulations Governing Practice Before the Internal Revenue Service, Before the IRS. Simply put, regulations, how do you practice in front of the IRS? Why are you learning about this topic? Because this topic is covered on the CPA exam as well as the enrolled agent exam. Now, if you are a CPA candidate or an enrolled agent candidate for that matter, please check out my website, farhatlectures.com. I don't replace your Becker, Roger, Gleam, or Wiley. I can be a useful addition to your CPA review course. I can add 10 to 15 points to your CPA score by explaining the material differently. I don't assume any prior knowledge. What you should do, try it out. I do have multiple choice through false questions to help you practice, but your risk is one month of subscription. Your return is passing the exam. Are you willing to take that risk? And if not for anything, check out my website to find out how well is your university doing on the CPA exam. I do have resources for other courses and CPA sections and connect with me on LinkedIn and check my LinkedIn recommendation. You will see what others what how others use the system because they do share their their uh, reviews on my website. Please like this recording, share it, connect with me on Instagram and Facebook. So let's talk about Circular 230. The first thing is we need to define who can practice in front of the IRS. So there we go. The following groups can practice before the IRS. Who are they? Well, there are four groups. The first group is attorneys lawyers. You have to be in good standing with the IRS as well as your state bar. Simply put, you cannot be disbarred. And you have to have a written declaration by the party authorized to represent. So if somebody assigned you, they said you can represent me, you have to have a written, written permission. Two, obviously, CPAs. This is what you are. This is, this is who you are going to be. You have to be a qualified CPA in your state or jurisdiction. And simply put, you cannot have a, your CPA cannot be suspended. You cannot be suspended from practice also by the IRS office because you could be suspended by the, IRF, by the IRS office of professional responsibilities and your state or your jurisdiction may or may not suspend you, but just you have to be aware of both rules. And you have to have a file written declaration by the party who appoints you. The third group is enrolled agents. Now, enrolled agents, they're also enrolled actuaries, another group, as well as enrolled retirement plan agents, but we don't really concern ourselves with them. Just remember, we have enrolled agents, EAs, those are EAs, and who's an EA? Somebody passed a CPA exam, not CPA, enrolled agent exam, an IRS enrolled agent exam. I believe it's three parts, and you might be one of these individuals who are listening to my recording to learn about this. And the fourth party is registered tax return preparers. Those they register with the IRS and they can and they can prepare returns. Now, uh, Circular 230, they have rules of conduct for people who practice in front of the IRS. And we're going to look at some of the rules of conduct. And this is a list of them. And we're going to look at each one separately, speak about it a little bit, enough that you can answer CPA questions on the CPA exam day. The first rules of conduct we're going to look at is conflict of interest. And what is conflict of interest? Simply put, it's a situation in which the concern or aims of two, of two different parties are in, incompatible. A classic situation is you are, you are the CPA of a husband and a wife. They're going through some divorce. They're having some IRS issues and you are representing both parties. If that's the case, you might have a conflict of interest. Okay, that, that, could be, that could be the case. What do you have to do under those circumstances you, to represent both parties? You, you want to make sure you have consent from both parties. Simply put, all parties have to be informed about this conflict of interest and you have to be in written within 30 days. Okay, now when I said all parties, it doesn't mean the IRS has to be known about this. Only the parties who are involved in this conflict, in this conflict of interest. Now, you cannot represent... Uh, parties, if you have conflict of interest, you're not allowed to do so if you believe your effectiveness to represent the parties is diminished by this conflict of interest. Simply put, you cannot give your best because if you give one representation, you're going to be harming the other. If you give one party a better representation, you'll be harming the other. So that's, you're not giving your best effort. Now, now if you watch uh, uh, Better Call Saul, sometime he would, rep or, or not Better Call Saul, um, Breaking Bad, he was representing at some point people with different conflict of interest. Hopefully you can uh, relate to that, uh, to that show.
Okay, I like that show. Breaking Bad. Okay, information to be furnished to the IRS. So what if the IRS asks you for records and information? What do you have to do? Well, generally speaking, you have to submit the information if you are asked by an authorized officer or an employee of the IRS. Unless, unless, unless you truly believe you have a reasonable belief, not reasonable, reasonable, reasonable belief in good faith that the information is privileged or the request is not proper or lawful. And under those circumstances, you don't have to give them the information. Let's assume they ask you, but you don't have the information, but you know who has the information, then you have to let them know what other person would help them with their request. So if you don't have the information, but you know, well, you have to exercise due diligence. And what is due diligence? Basically, being careful and, and have a persistent work or effort. That's what due diligence is. So you have to exercise due diligence when you are preparing and assisting and preparing tax returns, filing returns, documents, and other papers related to the IRS. Simply put, when you're going to be presenting information to the IRS, you have to be very careful. You have to have all your I's dotted and your T's crossed because they're going to challenge you. Okay? And due diligence is assumed if you rely on the work product of another person. And now that, that's not only the case. It's not like, well, I, I, I relied on that other person and use reasonable care in hiring or engaging that other party. You're supervising that other party if you, if you have to and evaluating the person's capabilities. So it's not only, well, I relied on the other person, therefore I did my due diligence. Well, you did rely, that's fine. You made that choice, but make sure you... You, 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 you vetted them, you make sure that they are competent, you supervise them, you review their work, okay? So also the practitioner may not unreasonably delay any matter before the IRS, so don't drag your feet, that's not, that's not due diligence, that's, you cannot claim due diligence and delay the process, okay? Client records, notice here the word client, so remember that word client, right? You must return, notice I underline must return client record, regardless of a fee dispute. So if you have a dispute with the client, they did not pay their fee, you still have to return their, their, their record. You know, it belongs to the client, it's the client record. Remember, the client might have to file the return and you're hindering that process. If they don't have the record, they cannot file the return, they wanna go somewhere else. Now, bear in mind, paperwork prepared by the practitioner is not required to be returned. I'll give you a simple example. For example, you have you have a client, uh, they have a lot of medical expenses. In, and I remember one client, they have over $100,000 in medical expenses and they just simply gave you their, their bills. You, you, you add up all the bills that qualify for a medical expense. You don't have to give them that Excel sheet. That's that's work paper prepared by, by you, by the practitioner. That's not that. That's not their work paper. OK, now there is an exception to that rule about returning the record. In some state, what happened is they allow you to withhold the record. They allow you to withhold the record if there is a fee dispute. However, you have to return any record that's required to be attached with the return. For example, you'll have to send your W-2. You have to attach it. Certain certain forms, they have to be attached to the return. So that, that you have to return. Also, you have to give them reasonable access and the right to review and copy any records. So simply put, it's, it's a law without teeth in my opinion, but you have to know about that rule that in certain state, you can you can withhold the record. Also, the, when we say the client records, that includes any work done by a third party on behalf of the client. So if the client hired a third party to do, to do some work on their behalf as part of this engagement, you cannot withhold that record because they hired that third party. A good example will be, let's assume you're working with, uh, for a construction company. And uh, part of the revenue is they do the revenue based on percentage of completion. And you want to know how many units they constructed for a particular year or how far are they in the process. They might hire an architect or an engineer to review that and they will give you a report. Now, because they hired them, they did the work on their behalf. That's their record as well. Remember, your record is anything prepared by you, the practitioner. That's your paperwork. You don't have to return it. But any paperwork by a third party that was hired on behalf of the client, that's their paperwork, okay? What happened if you discovered there are some cl clients non-compliance? Simply put, the clients made errors or omission in the past and now you discovered them. What do you have to do? Well, what do you have to do? You are required to advise the client about the non-compliance. Look, 
Here's the issue, and you have to tell them about the consequences of non-compliance or the errors or what the emission or whatever it is. You don't have to tell the IRS. This is, they always test you on this. You don't have to tell the IRS. You don't work for, you don't work for the IRS. You work for your client. You don't have to tell the IRS. And you don't need to withdraw from the engagement if you don't want to, you don't, you know. And some of the answers I'll say, part of it is withdrawal. You don't have to withdraw. Just be aware of these two tricky, kind of, they sound very uh, logical, but you have to be aware of them. Rules about solicitation and advertisement. Uh, obviously, we all advertise somehow, even if on a personal level, so you have to be careful. You cannot have any false, misleading, deceptive, unfair statement. You can't do any of these, whether you do them privately or in public. Privately means whatever you tell someone in person, you know, in a conference, or you, you, you put them on, on the web. Right, you, you have an ad on a website or a billboard or anything like this. You cannot, you cannot do that. And this reminds me again, better call Saul about solicitation and an advertisement. If not, just look up that movie, look up that show on uh, on Netflix. I'm laughing because I, I, I know I'm, this is the second time I mentioned this. Um, you cannot give any guarantees. Like I'll give you the maximum refund, or just come along. You know, use my service and you will not pay any taxes. You cannot give those guarantees. That's basically not good. Uh, you cannot, you know, you cannot uh, present yourself as an, in an expertise unless you have the credential. You have to back that up. Okay. Now, each of the following fees might be advertised. What are they? Fixed fees for specific routine services. They must be honored for 30 days. A range of fees for particular services. That's fine. The fee for an initial consultation, hourly rate, availability, of a written fee schedule that's all that's all okay and you can communicate this information in many ways radio email tv newspaper etc and you have to keep a record of three years of that advertisement okay there are certain things that you cannot do just they're easy to kind of remember they're a no-no one you cannot endorse you cannot endorse which is negotiate a check issued to a client yourself so if the refund check is issued to the client you cannot endorse it to yourself and do anything with it. You can keep it for them until they come back from that, from that, uh, you know, from that vacation or whatever they are. But you cannot endorse it for any reason. Simply put, remember, if it says endorsement, you cannot endorse that check to you. Okay? You may not charge what's called unconscionable fee in con in connection with, with any matter before the IRS. What is unconscionable fee? It's basically a high fee because a lot of people they get afraid when they are being uh, audited by the IRS, you might be able to take advantage of them. So it said, you can do that. You know, for example, somebody who is not familiar with the process or an old person, you can do that. Okay. You cannot also charge a contingent fee. What is a contingent fee? Contingent fee, a fee upon the performance, you know, commission, like a commission. If I get you $10,000, I'll get 20% of that or pay for performance. The more I get, the more I get paid. You can do that unless unless it's an IRS examination. So notice here, it's an examination. And it, 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 it's an examination of an original return, amended return, or claims for refunds and credit. If it's an IRS examination that deals with those, then that's okay, because the, the now you are being challenged by the IRS. Now, if you can beat the IRS, good for you. We'll pay you more, okay? It's an examination. Remember, it's an examination. You cannot give any advice to the client that's considered f frivolous tax position. Simply put, you're given that, that, that advice in bad faith and you know it's wrong. That's what, it, that's what it means. You can't do that. Now, also, you have to be competent. Now, how do we define competency? Well, you have to possess appropriate level of skills and knowledge. How do you demonstrate this? Well, you, you can demonstrate this through experience. You can demonstrate this through education. If you do research. Uh, if you, you can consult with experts and you become, you know, competent in the topic. So that's, it's not, it's, it's not, uh, it's not difficult. Also, the Circular 230 recommends some best practices. What are some of those best practices? You have to provide the highest quality representation. What is highest quality representation? Well, they're going to give you four general elements to show you what's high, what's the, uh, what's the highest quality representation. One. If you have to have a clear communication between you and the client, 
the terms of engagement. That's called the terms of engagement. Communicating clearly with the client about the terms of the engagement. What are we? What's the purpose of our engagement? Usually, that's documented in the engagement letter. Like you remember the engagement letter that you either learn about and auditing, or you would learn about something called the engagement letter. It's like a contract. What, what am I doing for you? Let's spell it out. That's one. Two. Any conclusion that you give to the client must be supported by evidence, facts, and law. And you did your due diligence. You did a lot of work. You did research, enough research that you can you can back that position. Advise the client about any potential issues with the conclusion. Simply put, if, you, if you're going to be challenged by the IRS, you got to let them know, look, we might be challenged by the IRS. And if we're challenged, we might have to pay penalties if you're going to rely on my advice. So those are best practices. You have to let them know up front. And obviously, you have to act fairly and with integrity before the IRS, of course. Now, this is if you're a sole proprietorship. If, if we're dealing with a firm, the firm will have to make sure all their members' employees follow the standards. They should have a good internal control. Simply put, they will need to disseminate this information, educate their employees, train them, test them, supervise them, make sure that they're, that they're, that they're doing what they're supposed to do. Let's look at other issues. You must inform the client about any penalty reasonably likely to apply with the respect of any document submitted to the IRS. If it's reasonably likely, you have to let them know. Any position taken on a tax return, for example, where you know we're we're gonna defer this revenue or we're gonna take this expense, well, you have to let them know. If it's reasonably likely, reasonably likely, we're gonna hit it, we're gonna be charged with a penalty. You have to let them know. If you gave them the advice, prepare the return or sign the return. Okay. What happened if information provided by the client? If information provided by the client, generally speaking, you have to rely on it. You're not really auditing the client. I used to prepare tax return. The client will give you the information and there is no way for you to verify it. Okay, but of course, you can use your common sense. Oftentimes, if the information is incomplete, you have to let them know. If some of the information is contradictory, if it's wrong, if it's questionable, it's unreasonable, they should have certain expenses and they don't have those expenses. Um, the revenue is way below what they're supposed to have, so on and so forth. So if any of this information appears to you, then you can question it. That's that's up to you how far you want to go. But generally speaking, you have to you accept whatever the client is giving you. Uh, written media, any written communication, written advice about any federal tax matter should be based on advice. Uh, the advice should be based on reasonable assumptions. You have to comply with all relevant facts, laws, no cherry picking. You pick the laws that you want and keep the other ones. Um, and the communication can be paper, physical, or electronics, and this will include email or even text as well. Okay. So the advice must not consider, this is important, must not consider. So when you give an advice, you cannot consider the possibility that either a tax return will not be audited or the matter will not be raised during an audit. So you cannot tell the client, look, let's not worry about this. This will never get audited or this, you, you don't. You give the advice based on the facts, the laws, and the evidence that you have, not based on the possibility. There's a low possibility it's gonna be audited or raised during an audit. That's not, that's not how you do things. Practitioner, you can rely on good faith on other practitioner, but not anyone, only if the advice is reasonable, given all the facts and circumstances. Obviously, if you're relying on someone, you have to make sure they are reasonable, they are competent, uh, they have enough expertise in the field. Okay, So, the practitioner can rely on the advice of a person also who is either, who either the practitioner knows or should have knows is not, should have know is not competent to provide the advice, or that individual has some conflict of interest in their decision. Therefore, you should not rely on their advice because there's a, remember the conflict of interest. They may not be giving you the best advice. So what happened in case of violation? Well, the Secretary of the Treasury may censor you, suspend suspend you or disbar you from practice before the IRS. So any practitioner who does the following to be is shown to be incompetent, not in good faith, obviously, and does not have a good reputation, disreputable, refuses to comply with rules and regulation relating to practice before the IRS, you're just disregarding the rules, willfully or knowingly with the intent to defraud, deceive, mislead, or threaten the clients. Well, you'll be subject to disbarment, you'll be subject to suspension, okay? The following is a brief list, okay? We're gonna look at them. That could result in suspension or disbarment. 
basically being convicted of an offense involving dishonesty or breach of trust, simply put, we don't want you to practice in front of us, providing false or misleading information to the Treasury Department or the IRS, negotiating a client's refund. Remember, you cannot do that. Remember, you cannot endorse the check or not prominently remitting a refund a check. You, can't, you cannot withhold any money. Circulating or publishing matter relating to practice before the, the, the DRS that deemed libelous or malicious. You can't do that. Using abusive language. Suspension from practice as a CPA by any state licensing authority, any federal court of record or any federal agency, body or board. So simply put, if your state says you're out, you're no longer a CPA, well, that may result in suspension and practicing before the IRS. Conviction of any felony involving the conduct that renders the practitioner unfit to practice before the IRS. Attempting to influence the official action of, a, of an IRS employee. You know, simply put, you're trying to bribe them. Willfully evading or assisting others to evade any federal tax payment. You cannot, is evading, you, you, you can try to lower your tax bill legally, but you cannot evade or assist other in evading. Okay, yeah, a notice of disbarment or suspension of a CPA from practice before the IRS is issued to the IRS employees who gets direct, they get a record of your name, interested department and agencies of the federal government and your state licensing authority, which they could in some situation, your state might also suspend your license in the state to practice in the state, basically take away your CPA. So make sure you are ethical. That's, 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 that's the lesson here. At the end of this recording, I'm going to remind you, for additional lectures, please visit farhatlectures.com. As I mentioned earlier, I don't replace your CPA review course. I'm only an addition. I'm only that vitamin pill, that supplement that could help you increase your score, which in turn help you pass the CPA and go ahead and practice in front of the IRS. Good luck, study hard, and stay ethical.